I want to tell a story that I have told you before, so if you've been around a little bit, because every time I think of a shortcut, I think of this story because of how much it cost me. But um, I, I used to, I, I've got a little bit older and wiser now, I hope, but I, I used to enjoy doing the Doozy Canoe Marathon, uh, which is a canoeing race for three days from Peter Maritzburg to Durban. Uh, and it's, I don't know why they call it a canoeing race, because it's kind of like a biathlon, because you've got to carry your boats over some pretty rough terrain, as well as pedal your boat. But I was uh, going with, I was pedaling with a guy called Stephen Stott, uh, who happens to be family, but also the brother of Ant Stott, who is one of the most decorated uh, canoeists ever. And so that, that whole family, I only say that because that whole family is highly competitive when it comes to canoeing, and I felt a little bit out of my league. Uh, and so I trained exceptionally hard, and we come to day two, and day two is moving day in the doozy, and, uh, and we were looking for a particular place that we wanted to come in the doozy, and we had a great first day, and we were really uh, racing it hard, and Steve came to me on the, on the end of the first day uh, in the evening and said, I've gone onto Google Maps, and I have found a shortcut for day two. I did not feel that I was in a position to question the shortcut. I was just the guy on the back paddling. And I uh, said, okay, Stephen, I mean, you, you are Mr. Doozy family. Uh, you guys go for it. You tell me. I'll do whatever you say. And so as we're paddling, we come to that moment where the race directors have said, everybody has to get out here and start their run. But Stephen thinks, no, 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 I've got a shortcut. We're going to paddle a little bit further. And so we are gunning it because we're going to intercept all of those runners and we're going to be ahead of them. And as we're going... We see a chopper over here, so we go, oh, they're filming us. This is our moment. And then the chopper comes a little bit close to us, and we're like, okay, that's uncomfortably close because that, those chopper blades create quite a wind, and we are already on an unstable boat. And, uh, and then it starts to tip. And so its rotors start blocking our path on the river. Now, I don't know if you know that water actually moves in a river. So... Unless we stop and start paddling backwards, we are heading towards the rotor blades of the helicopter. And the guy st shouts over a loud hailer. He says, you are not allowed to be here. Turn around. And we shouted to him, how on earth are we supposed to turn around? It is a river. We cannot paddle back upstream. He says, I don't care. You missed the takeout point. Get back there. We had no option. And so we have to pull over to the side. We can't go back. We didn't hit our shortcut route. And so now we have to go through a bush where there is no path. It turns out by the time we got to the top, we had climbed double the amount of heights than everybody else had to climb with their boat. It also took us, we were going to save 15 minutes on the shortcut because he had done all the calculation. It took us an extra three and a half hours. Well, that blew our race out. He never raced with me again, as though it was my fault. But I learned a valuable lesson that shortcuts are very seldom worth it. Shortcuts are very seldom worth it. And not only are they seldom worth it, they end up costing you a whole lot. As we stand today, as we're in Legacy Month, as we're just looking at just what biblical stewardship looks like, at what it means to leave a legacy. How do we leave a legacy? I, I was just reminded of this, that so many of us have these dreams and desires, and we think, well, if I just do this, or if I just do this, so I've got a shortcut, or I, I'm trusting for that, and I'm trusting, da, 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 you know, or we're always making a plan. The scriptures are actually quite clear that very seldom does a shortcut work. Actually, there's a biblical pattern to the way we should steward our resources. There's a biblical pattern to how a legacy should be built and left. There's a biblical pattern. I'm reminded of the scripture in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. For my thoughts, says God, are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Oh God, would we learn that lesson now? Because some of us are not young, so I can't say when we're young. Can we just learn the lesson today that your ways are higher than my ways? Your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. As the race director of the doozy knew that it was dangerous to take that shortcut and so exited us all earlier, would we follow your ways because the creator and the designer of our lives and life here on earth should know better which is the better path to take? 
So, Spirit of God, I pray that you would continue your work amongst us. We pray today that as the word is kind of brought to us, that you would teach us and show us and help us, that we would know your ways, your patterns, and what you're leading us into. Again, this whole series, this whole month is, is not a pressure month. It's, it's, it's not here to put something on you, but to help us be released into the ways of God. Our desire as pastors is to follow what Jesus came to do, which he says, I come that you may have life and have it to the full. Not to come and put you under a burden, but to come and have fullness of life. And so everything we teach her, that is our endeavor, that it is to come so that we may understand what the patterns and the ways of life are that lead us into fullness. And so that is what we are desiring to do. Uh, as I have mentioned uh, on, the first week, on, the, on the first week of September, uh, vision gets us inspired, but it very seldom gets us to where we want to go to. It's discipline that gets us there. Vision gets us inspired, but it's discipline that gets us there. We are going to be inspired next week when we see these pictures. You're going to be inspired. But that doesn't mean that the building just pops up. It's going to be discipline that gets us there. See, our future is determined by the decisions that we make today. Our race was determined by the decision that we made on that day to take a shortcut which wasn't on the race director's route. The decisions that we make today in accordance with God's ways or our ways, will determine what our future becomes. That's where we want to head. Remember a legacy. I've been saying this each week. A, a legacy is that which is our testimony that's been passed down to the next generation. It's the emotions that people feel when they hear your name. I want people, when they hear my name, to have a pleasing emotion attached with that. That's my desire it's the encouragement they receive during their tough days as they remember your example. When people are under pressure, but they've encountered you when you are under pressure, what is that testimony? That's a legacy. That's what we are looking to leave. And we've spoken about Genesis chapter 12 because that's been a directing verse for us in this season as Anthem. And uh, we probably know that ad nauseum now for those that are part of Anthem, but for the benefit of those that are maybe here for the first time, we have felt God call us. Genesis chapter 12, to arise and go to a land that I'll show you, and there I will make you a blessing. And then there are a couple of verses which are important to read uh, for yourself, but it, it ends with, and they arrived. And they arrived. Words that aren't often spoken about in our lives. We've all got these grand dreams. We've all got these desires. We've all got all of these things, but very few people actually arrive at accomplishing those. I love the story that by God's help, Abraham was called to something by discipline, he was able to fulfill the vision that God had, and they arrived. And so our desire is that we would be a people that arrive because we follow his ways, not ours. And so I want to look at something, just a, a, a pattern for legacy. Okay, a pattern for legacy. How many points do I normally preach? Three. Okay, today we've got ten. I just thought I'd change things up a little bit, you know? Just make sure that Don stays on his, uh, on his game here. Today I've got 10, but we're going to move. So basically there's a story uh, that we read of David who was uh, the king of Israel. Uh, and so God had appointed David to be the leader of this people that God had put his hand for blessing upon, right? Uh, and so we know that that doesn't translate into today, into today, church leader. No, it becomes Jesus. So David was a foreshadowing of Jesus the leader of God's people. And since Jesus, there has been no other leader of God's people. Jesus is the leader of God's people, right? And so we can equate David to Jesus, not David to Richard. Okay, let's just be clear on that. And so uh, when we're thinking David and we're pulling these out, uh, don't be reading the text of, okay, so is Richard trying to equate the anthem elders into the story? No, I'm trying to equate Jesus into the story as we pull them as we, as we go through this. But there's this moment where David uh, feels by the Spirit of God that he has a dream to build a house where God can reside on earth. Uh, because God up until that point had just been living in a tent and David felt that was not appropriate for the God that he served. And God was quite okay in a tent, but uh, he was also quite okay with David saying, okay, that's cool. Uh, you can build me a house and I'll reside there also uh, for my name's sake and 
so that you can be a blessing to a whole bunch. And so we're going to pick up the story in 1, 1 Chronicles chapter 28, and we're just going to go through it in the number of points that I'm going to pick out, all right? And so this is going to be a Q&A, but you're going to answer it in your own head or at home, all right? You're not going to shout out your answer. So I'm going to ask you questions, and you're going to answer them for yourself. So we read in 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verses 1 and 2. David summoned all the officials of Israel to assemble at Jerusalem. We're going to skip a few verses. So King David rose to his feet and he said, Listen to me, my fellow Israelites, my people. I had it in my heart to build. It happens to be a house uh, for the rest, at, for, as a place of rest for the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Uh, and I made plans to build it. And so the, the first kind of point in terms of a legacy, there's, remember this is a pattern or a framework for building a legacy and leaving a legacy, is David summoned the people of Israel. And so my first point is just summons. Who has summoned you? Who has summoned us? You see, what, what summoned or summons does is it's, it's the who question. It's who are we gathering around? Who has called us to what we are doing? And so the question could be answered, I, I've called myself to what I'm doing, or my spouse has called me to what I'm doing, or my kids have called me to what I'm doing. Uh, obviously, the correct answer would be that God has called me to what I'm doing, um, uh, or, or the most prominent answer uh, would be that. And so just in terms of a, of a pattern for legacy, there's, there's the summons. And I know we use the language of Jesus has invited us into his story. Uh, I get that. And so inviting and summons uh, are, are two words that carry a different tone to them. But uh, I'm reminded in Matthew chapter 11, uh, the story is in 1 to 19, but there's a particular verse where Jesus says, from the time of John the Baptist until now, violent people have been trying to take over the kingdom of heaven by force. That to me speaks of Jesus. There's an invitation for the acceptance by the mercy of God for the forgiveness of sin. But then there's a commissioning to the mission of God. And that commissioning is less an invitation and more of a summons. Actually, there are violent people that are trying to take over the kingdom of God here on earth. And actually, it's the people of God by the Spirit of God that need to be a little bit more forceful. We're gathering around the mission of Jesus. Jesus has summoned us as David summons the people. Jesus has summoned us. And so the question is, who has summoned you? Who has summoned you? Just a question for you to answer. Who are we gathering to? The story continues uh, in verse 8, and so David says, and so now I charge you in the sight of all Israel and of the assembly of the Lord and in the hearing of our God, be careful to follow all the commands of the Lord your God, that you may possess this good land and pass it on as an inheritance to your descendants forever. Now I charge you. A simple definition of charge is a duty and a responsibility that must be obeyed. We come into the New Testament. Paul charges Timothy to continue the work of ministry. And so if summons is uh, the, the word that declares who do we gather to, then charge is what we gather to. What we gather to. And so I want to ask you the question, what are you gathered to? There is this charge that David, the leader of God's people, he's gathered them, he summons them, and then he charges them, this is what we are going to do. And so who are we gathered to and what are we gathered to is a question that we need to ask ourselves and answer for ourselves. As the Anthem community, we've come together around Jesus Christ and Jesus has put us on a defined mission. Are you gathered to that defined mission? There is both the church and there is Jesus. And Jesus is coming back for his church. So we have to allow him, as I said on the first week of this legacy series, is we've got to allow God to lead us in who we love. It is the church that he's coming back for. So charge is the what question. What are we gathered to? Third thing, 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verses 9 and 10. 
And you, my son Solomon, acknowledge the God of your father and serve him with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches every heart and understands every desire and every thought. And so the third uh, little uh, thing for us to take hold of here is acknowledgement. Who do we acknowledge in the story? Who do we acknowledge? There's this acknowledgement that we have to, uh, we got to do. And, and so David, so Solomon's his son, David doesn't get to build the temple for those that are unfamiliar with the story, but his son gets to build it. But David makes preparation for it, rallies the people, gathers them, and then says, actually, you've got to acknowledge God in this because it's God who's called us to this. And so there's an acknowledgement. Who do we acknowledge? Fourth, there's this thing called submission which generally in today's day and age we don't like. Verse 12, he gave him the plan. So this is David to Solomon. He gave him the plans of all that the Spirit had put in his mind for the courts of the temple of the Lord and all the surrounding rooms, for the treasures, the treasuries of the temple of God and for the treasuries of the dedicated things. There has to be a submission to God's way and God's plan. His ways are higher than ours. His thoughts are higher than ours. Is there a submission? We can acknowledge God, but not necessarily follow His ways. Do I dare say that all of us, in some shape or form, uh, are not following the entirety of God's ways? Uh, As we endeavor to mature with Jesus, as we continue to allow the Spirit of God to help us in our relationships, in 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 our relationship with our finances, in the relationship to our spouses, in the relationship to our bosses or to our employees, in the relationship to the world around us, There is a pattern and a way, and we're all trying to mature into that, but there has to be a submission to the one who has designed it. As Stephen and I did not submit to the course designer of the doozy and ended up costing us much more than we had bargained for, so it is with us when we are navigating, trying to leave a legacy and build a legacy and navigate our, st- our, our finances. If we think that we can do it devoid of submitting to the one who created and designed all things, then I think we are going to find ourselves taking a whole lot longer to get to the top of the mountain and a whole lot more exhausted and not finishing where we desired to finish. Fifth. See, I'm moving quite quickly, eh? Fifth. No, that's, that's not three, that's four. You've missed one. Number five, clarity. All this, David said, I have in writing as a result of the Lord's hand on me, and he's enabled me to understand all the details of the plan. I love this, that God is not just this ethereal, uh, on a cloud God. Hey, acknowledge me, and my ways are higher than your ways. And da, da, da. No, he's also given a plan, like a very practical, detailed plan. And so the Spirit of God gave David, this is what it's going to look like. This is how we're going to build it. This is what we're going to do. And there's, there's a practical, there's a vision that inspires us, but there's discipline that's going to get us there. Uh, like David leaves all of that. And so too does God give us a plan. Ephesians chapter 2, we've spoken about this many, many times, where Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus, and he says, Once, before Jesus Christ, we were alienated, we were separated, we were excluded from the commonwealth of the people. Not the commonwealth, I know there's been a lot of activity around the British commonwealth right now, just given what's been going on, but but this is God's commonwealth. From the commonwealth of the people, exclusion, uh, isolation, all of that kind of stuff. But then there's Jesus who has broken down the dividing wall of hostility. And so now, what? We are built together. We are built together. We are formed together. We have access. We are joined together. There was a word that came before the service and the pre-service prayer time that that Nix was carrying, that God was, was, his desire was to to entwine us, entwine. Like a rope is three things, you know, you get it. We're entwined together. There's this there's this thing of that we, that we are joined together. We're building together. We have access together. God has given us the pattern. And so there is this clarity. We are not without a clear directive. So we've been summoned to who? We've been charged with what? We can acknowledge that it's from God. We submitted to His ways, and there is a clear call. There is a clear call. So what do we do about it? So the first five are kind of 
asking all those questions. The next five is the kind of the meat of the pattern of building legacy as we go. We carry on reading in, in verse 20 of 1 Chronicles 28. David said to Solomon, his son, be strong and courageous and do the work. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will not fail you or forsake you until all the work for the service of the temple of the Lord is finished. And so the point for me on this is that we would strengthen each other. There's a pattern to legacy and it is strengthen each other. And I, I ask this question, are you a discourager or an encourager? What do you see first? Do you see the whole, H-O-L-E, or do you see the whole, W-H-O-L-E? Because there are far too many people that see the holes, and you become a discourager. Whereas God calls us to be with Jesus and see the whole of what he's building, which allows us to be an encourager. And so, church, I want to call you to strengthen one another. Let's strengthen each other. Let's encourage one another. Let's not discourage one another. There's a pattern to leaving a legacy. Let's watch how we talk. Let's watch how we think because how we talk is an overflow of our heart. And sometimes that takes some work. Maybe you are more inclined to see the holes than the whole. Identify that today and ask God, can I become a person that sees the whole? and not the holes. Ask the Spirit of God to change you and transform you by the renewing of your mind, because when you see the whole, your natural disposition is to encourage, not to discourage. We get to strengthen one another, not weaken one another. I love what David said to his son, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. God is with you. He will not forsake you until all the work is finished. How's that from a, from a father to a son? From a father to a son. You can do this, my boy. You can do this. Yes, it's hard, but you can do this. Let's be those people, friends. Number seven. We into 1 Chronicles chapter 29 in the first couple of voices, uh, verses. First couple of verses, and David says this. The task is great. Because this palatial structure is not for man, but for the Lord God. And it goes down. He says, in my devotion to the temple of my God, I now give my personal, my personal treasures. And, it's, and it says, over and above everything that I've already provided. And so there's this, this thing, a pattern for legacy uh, requires devotion. It requires devotion. So the question is, what are we devoted to? What we're devoted to, the definition of devotion is what we have love for, what we have loyalty to, what we have enthusiasm for. And so if I were to ask you that question, so forget the word devotion. What do you love? What are you loyal to? Loyal to? What are you enthusiastic for? Those things will determine, the answer to that will determine what you're devoted to. But David says, I'm devoted to God and providing a home for him so that the people of God can have a place to worship. That's David's devotion. And so devotion leads him to a contribution. That's what devotion does. Devotion leads him to a contribution. Will you let God lead you in who you are to love? Will you let God lead you in who you are to love? I know the church is a mess. I'm in it. I'm in it. I stand here with my shirt untucked. Come on, Rich. Can you at least not tuck your shirt in? You're in it. Oh, and we are beautiful. We are beautiful because the Spirit of God has redeeming stories. I love that song that we sung. I almost came up to lead us in a time and just of, um, I may get the words wrong, but we, we have this redemption song that we'll sing and we'll sing it all along, all day long. What is your redemption story? We have redemption stories, friends. I used to be this, but now I'm this. I was like that and now I'm like this. I, I thought like this and now I'm like that. I, like we, we all have redemption songs. The church is beautiful, friends, with our warts. 
with our pimples. We are beautiful because of what God is doing in us. See the whole, not the holes. What are we devoted to? Jesus is devoted to us, his church. And sometimes he looks at us and we're turning on one another. He says, no, you are my people who I'm coming back for. You are the beautiful. You are the one I've gave my life to. Don't treat each other like that. Be encouraged, not discouraged. See what my redemption song in each of your life is. Please don't treat each other like that. Please don't think like that. Please don't speak like that. Please don't let your heart get like that. Who will we love? Who will we be devoted to? And then David, so he talks about his own personal devotion. And then remember, he's still got everybody in front of him in that moment. And he says this, now, who is willing to consecrate themselves to the Lord today? Who is willing to consecrate themselves to the Lord today? And so the third thing we see is this, uh, this consecration. So David is devoted to. Uh, it's, it's what he is loyal to. It's what he loves. It's what he is enthusiastic for. But then there's this consecration, which is the act of making something sacred and holy. And so he says, okay, so this is what I'm devoted to, but now will you people consecrate yourselves with me? Who will consecrate yourself along with me? Who will make yourself holy for this task that we've been summoned for by the king? That we acknowledge, that we've been charged with, that there's the clear direction of, that there's a submission to, that we've strengthened ourselves for. Will we take this devotion and will we ring fence it? Will we consecrate it? Will we make it sacred and holy for this task that Jesus has called us to? Will we make it sacred? It's a question we have to answer, friends. And what does consecration and devotion do? I love this 1 Chronicles chapter 29, and this is where we're going to spend about a couple of minutes. Then the leaders of families, the officers of the tribes, it basically mentions a whole bunch of people. That's why I just cut it out there. It says, they gave willingly. Anyone who had precious stones gave them to the treasury. The people rejoiced at the willing response of their leaders, for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. I love the fact that consecration leads to contribution. When we consecrate ourselves, when we ring fence ourselves towards something that we're devoted to, it's what, it, what it lands in is a contribution. So here, it was, it, was a, it was a monetary contribution. I'm talking beyond that. We're talking legacy here. So the money is part of it, but it's not all of it. What we consecrate ourselves to, we contribute towards to. So if we are devoted, if we love, if we're loyal to, if we're enthusiastic for the church, Anthem, His Bride, this community, if we're devoted to this and we consecrate ourselves to this and we ring fence ourselves and make this sacred and holy, the automatic outcome of that will be a contribution towards this. Not just financial, but we will contribute, we will strengthen, we will encourage, we will find a way forward. We will not just be envisioned, but our discipline will take us to completion. We will get there. There is no other outcome to devotion and consecration than contribution. If we are devoted to shoes, some of you are laughing because you know something about me. If you are devoted to shoes... There is a contribution that follows your devotion. Let's be devoted to more than shoes, please. I love this, that people rejoiced at the willing response of their leaders, for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. This speaks to me of, a, of an attitude or a disposition. They were, they were ready. There was, a, there was a disposition. It wasn't like just in that moment. They lived with a disposition. And then when the summons and the charge came, it was ready. They just needed to be pointed in a direction. And so I'm going to just take a few minutes on this and then the tenth point and we're done. But this attitude and this disposition, this disposition, I, I want to just look at, and, and I, 
I can only go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 8. And this is about how do we excel in this grace of giving. And Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. And he says, and now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of, very severe, of a very severe trial. Yeah? Their overflowing joy. Maybe a little less. And their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. What did these guys have? What did they have in their heart disposition? For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability entirely on their own, not even being asked. They urge, urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the Lord's people. This disposition which had their eyes open to the church. And I can see that Robin Tooley needs something. And I can see co-church Bevan and Tam Russell needs something. And I can see Mark Van Pletsen at Life Changes needs something. And I can see, and I can see, why? Because my eyes are trained, my devotion is towards the church, my consecration is towards the church, and so my eyes are seeing. So I don't have to be asked because I'm watching and I'm seeing, and it naturally, my consecration naturally leads to contribution. And so with the Macedonian churches, I'm able to, uh, 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 with the Corinthian, what, what has given the message, uh, he gave them, the yeah. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the Lord's people. Can we be a people that are, oh, we're pleading because our disposition is there. We're geared towards it. Point and shoot. Point and shoot. Amy, Richard, we, I'm, lock, I'm locked and loaded. And they exceeded our expectations. Oh, I love that when people exceed expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. And so we urge Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, imagine that as a testimony of the church. Because you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. Oh, it's so beautiful and rich. Out of severe trial, overflowing joy, extreme poverty, rich generosity. I, I love the fact that their external circumstance, extreme poverty, did not trump their internal disposition of overflowing joy. And so there was rich generosity, not because of external circumstance, but because of what was internal. And so we go back to the contribution made by the people willingly and wholeheartedly. How do we excel? Quick, quick couple of things. Do we, do we see giving as a joy or a pain? We're talking legacy now, so I'm going to just narrow it down to money. Do we see giving as a joy or a pain? Sometimes those things are so closely linked. Like I genuinely dislike running. I genuinely dislike running. It hurts me. But I know that it's good for me. And so when I get on the road... I know there are endorphins released. I know my body is becoming healthier. I know all of that in the midst of the pain. And so sometimes joy and pain can be a little bit confusing. But what trumps out over what? See, I could sit on my bed getting ready for a run and I can focus on the pain and I can say, not today. Or I can focus on the joy and I can get out there and make sure that I am stronger, I'm in better condition for what's to come. What are we going to choose, joy or pain? You see, Jesus said, for the joy set before him, he endured the pain of the cross. Imagine he had chosen the pain of the cross, and it trumped his joy. I'm so thankful that joy trumped pain. How do we excel in this manner of giving? We've got to decide for us, is it joy or is it pain? Is it joy or is it pain? Yes, there is a sacrifice. Yes, it comes at a cost. But the joy of seeing the bride more beautiful, the joy of seeing someone being able to be preached to in a far away space that wouldn't hear the gospel or wouldn't have someone to take the time to explain to them the redemptive hand of Jesus Christ. 
the joy of seeing somebody come to salvation surely has to trump the cost and the sacrifice and the pain of giving. We often start, but we don't finish. We have intention, but we don't follow through. How do we follow through in this? Well, we understand it as a privilege. Do we, is it a privilege or a burden? Is it a joy or pain? Is it a privilege or a burden? The definition of privilege is just where we have an advantage over someone else. You see, the problem, when we view ourselves as burdened, we're always looking at somebody that has more than us. And therefore, I'm in the burden state. But Jesus teaches us through the scriptures, be content in all situations. Can we see what God has put in our hands? Therefore, look at those that don't. And at the very least, we all have Jesus. We're in the privileged position. We're in the privileged position. But can we start just navigating our privilege a little bit better and our burden a little bit less? Because that will determine whether we excel in this area of giving. How could the church in Macedonia count it a privilege in the midst of extreme poverty? Because they didn't look at what they had. They didn't, they didn't look at what they didn't have. They looked at what they did have. Generosity is a disposition which lands in an act. And then the third thing we read in this text is they said first they gave themselves to the Lord. So the question for us is, are we first the Lord or are we first ourselves? If we want to excel in this thing of giving, making a contribution, is it first the Lord? Have we given the Lord the opportunity to lead us in who we love? We started on the 5th of September and I asked the question, will you allow the Lord to determine what you give this legacy month? Have you got before him and asked him that? Or have we allowed burden and pain to trump joy and privilege? Just a question. Overflowing joy is an internal condition which trumped their extreme poverty, their external condition, and a welled up in rich generosity and outward action. And then I close with this, point number 10, which I absolutely love. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 11. When Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord and had succeeded in carrying out all that he had in the mind to do, there's this thing called completion. And so I, I've entitled the message today, it's often quite strange to put the title at the end, but I want you to take home this. Devotion leads to completion. Devotion leads to completion. And consecration leads to contribution. What are you devoted to? What are you consecrated to? We are summonsed by Jesus. We are charged by Jesus. We acknowledge Jesus. We are submitted to Jesus. Jesus has made clear what our future holds and what we are to give ourselves to. Will we strengthen each other? Will we shape our devotion? Will we shape our consecration? Will we allow those two to shape our contribution so that we can stand one day and celebrate our completion? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.